Coming up on the Mod Squad, I talk to Ash and Wallaby from Fallout Ashfall, who are taking Fallout to somewhere it's never been before, Hawaii. So joining me is Ash and Wallaby from Project Ashfall. Thanks for joining me, fellas. Hello. So I like to start interviews by asking both of you what your first Fallout moment was. I was initially introduced to the Fallout franchise through Fallout 4's release trailer. However, my first Fallout game was Fallout New Vegas. I mainly played it because I, it was a spinoff, and I came to the assumption that because it was a spinoff, I wouldn't need context from the Fallouts 1 through 3 to just play it. I could just play it on its own without having to worry about the other games, and in a sense, I was right. <laughs> but, uh, but in all honesty, it was at the end of the what I like to call the West Coast trilogy of like Fallout 1, Fallout 2, and New Vegas. I kind of see those three games as its own story. And from there, it just sort of spiraled out of control. Uh, I became very obsessed with the Fallout franchise. Uh, for the longest time, I had this sort of weekly ritual where I would watch the storyteller show from a from shoddy cast and i would kind of immerse myself into the and keep in mind this is on um, xbox 360 right so it's not like i was playing all like the mods or anything like that i would just spend it, new vegas was kind of the only game i played for a while <laughs> and then you know i i had my break or so uh from new vegas got a new xbox played through fallouts four then three and then went backwards from there to one, then two, and I have not yet touched tactics or seventy six. I just yeah. I want to piggyback real quick. That's really interesting that you grouped New Vegas together with one and two because I've often wondered why nobody has thought to make a version of New Vegas that's in that isometric style of one and two, like I'm sure, releasing on iPad. I'm right. sure that's a thing. I'm pretty sure for a while on the iPhone you can get a app that basically took the combat system from Fallout 1 and remade it into the App Store, but because it was using Fallout assets and sprites and such it was taken down well, i know there's an android kit for a while you could move the directory files from fallout 1 or fallout 2 to a tablet and there was a, a root protocol or whatever it's called on android that would essentially let you use it as a touchpad and then play the game that way but it wasn't an official release it was like a player yeah. yeah it was basically piracy right yeah, that's interesting that you group them together like that, because I always thought that. But anyway, for me, I'm a little bit older. I'm in my mid-30s, and so my first Fallout experience was when my older brother brought home Fallout, a post-apocalyptic role-playing game. And we were like, what is this game? I would watch him play it, and a very fond memory one day when I was shutting off the computer, and my brother had extracted the, or one of the audio files from when you're, um... Oh, what's the name of that paladin? Or no, it's the Enclave guy. Oh, yeah, Sergeant like, Dorman. Who, what the fuck are you talking about? It's the president of the fucking United States. Who the fuck? Like, I shut off the computer one day, and that started shouting at me at the computer. I'm like, what? And then he's, my brother comes around the corner. Oh, yeah, that's from Fallout 2. I haven't shown it to you yet. Like, <laughs> that was my exposure was the initial one. And I tried playing it back then, and, like, I didn't really get it. So I really just watched my brother. The first Fallout that I actually was immersed in was Fallout 3. And I, I just remember, because I was in the Army at the time, and I remember coming downstairs, and there's a guy. He was on duty. His friend had brought down his Xbox to show him Fallout 3 that just came out the day before. And I was like, what? There's a new Fallout game? And I didn't know they were still making Fallout games. And so I got it, and I'm back in. Back in ever since. Big question then. Why Hawaii? What, what is it about the islands that appeals to you? I'll start off with the basic narrative layers. Hawaii, to me is a version of the Wasteland that has not dealt with the NCR or Brotherhood, probably not even the Enclave, and neither has it dealt with FEV. It's basically a version of the Wasteland that is a blank slate, and given Hawaii's real-world history, I should probably clarify, this is, we're not doing the entirety of Hawaii. We're doing the Big Island, also known as Hawaii Island, and even then, we're just doing the Puna region. It's very, it's a small part of the largest Hawaii, well, not even a, lot, a small part, it's fairly decently sized. I think when it comes to Hawaii as a location, you have a lot of opportunity to explore a sort of alternate version of the Fallout world where these settlements, where settlements can develop and thrive without worrying about 
these sort of existential threats like the Master or the Enclave. You basically get to see into a version of Fallout that has basically been untouched by the wider conflicts of the Wasteland. And I think that's a very fascinating kind of world to look into. And additionally, I also think that given what little pre-war war there is about Hawaii, I think that is, generally speaking, a blank slate to tell your own story with. To talk about what Hawaii could have been like during moments leading up to the Great War, I feel like that is absolutely a opportunity that can be capitalized on. I met Ash in another Discord server of gamers, and we were talking about Fallout stuff, and he mentioned that he was the lead on a New Vegas mod, and I told him how much I liked New Vegas and that I was a composer, and if he needed anything like that, and he said actually he did, and he offered me to be the composer. You've mentioned there is going to be a lack of familiar factions in your mod. What's driven this? Is it purely the location, or have you got deeper narrative reasons? For... Narrative logistics, I don't think it would make any sense for groups like the Enclave or Brotherhood or NCR to make reappearances on Hawaii. I'll admit, in the past, I did experiment with the idea of, well, what if the player could go in and sort of represent whatever faction they want to play as? But at the end of the day, we just don't have the size nor the know-how to figure out how something like that would work. So we kind of scrapped it immediately. Something I've noticed when it comes to many different kind of mods is that Despite going to what should be, for the most part, brand new locations, we often see reiterations of previous factions. It's not anything I hold against other projects. In my opinion, it has proven in the past in both mods and even official Bethesda games that just having factions like the Brotherhood of Steel in just about every corner of the wasteland is repetitive. The world feels very small if in every location you go to, whether that's in D.C. or Boston or West Virginia, if all the same factions from California and Nevada show up on the other side of the U.S., then it makes the world of Fallout feel way, way too small than it has any right to be. Imagine if in a hypothetical Fallout 5, you find out that Oh, I don't know, the railroad is all the way in uh, Montana, for example. (laughs) It would not only make sense on a logistical narrative level, but the railroad as a group, based off of the real world, well, American Railroad, have nothing to do with Montana. (laughs) I feel like if we are going to do a Fallout mod project like this, then we have no right to just recycle all of the different factions from previous Fallout games and other projects and just have them show up in a different location. I'll say this, there are exceptions to this, not in Nashville, but in other mods where it does make sense. If you're doing a mod that's set in California, of course the NCR is going to be there. If your mod is set in Arizona or any other Legion territories, of course the Legion is going to be there. But Hawaii is completely cut off from the rest of the world after the war. So there's no reason a chapter of the Brotherhood would end up on Hawaii, in my mind at least. Just some thoughts that I had about that, and I I googled some stats while you were talking here. To, to think, Because, I mean, I'm thinking, really, the only people who it would make sense to go to Hawaii would be either, like, the Enclave or the Brotherhood for means of securing any military technology that was left over. And pretty sure there's some missile defense there. I think there are two military, major military bases on Hawaii. One of them is Pearl Harbor, which, for clarification's sake, we are not doing anything with Pearl Harbor in Ashfall for two reasons. One, it's not on the island we're mainly working on, and two, there's already another mod project which has Pearl Harbor as like the central location of their mod, and I just don't see it as a very great idea to have overlapping locations for two separate mods. It would be the war over Pearl Harbor. You have two mods warring over which one has the best Pearl Harbor. That <laughs> <laughs> I want to make like a Clone Wars analogy, but I don't think that would work. According to Google, Hawaii is just under 2,500 miles from LA. 
So let's just say it's 2,000 miles from California, right? Because the range of a vertebrate is 175 miles. So you're not going to make it unless the Enclave or somebody build a big wave breaker. Yeah, well, let's see. They needed Navarro to live right on the coast to refuel them. It, they, they didn't have that range. Exactly. That was something else that interested me about the mod. When you consider Hawaii and how Hawaii functions, would be cut off from everything else? Would there be a direct nuclear strike? Would it be impacted? How would the people there be living? And how could that relate into the Fallout universe? What type of mod is this to you and what are you hoping to achieve with it? So for me, I would have Fallout Ashfall be perfectly described as what would happen if Fallout and Deus Ex had a baby. <laughs> and for those who don't know what Deus Ex is, it's a really good cyberpunk RPG. <laughs> I would like to see Ashfall become a strong RPG with some elements of uh, survival that you can opt into th via the hardcore mode. We are balancing the new weapons and new items with hardcore mode in mind. Uh, ideally, though, you should be able to just play Ashfall, treat like an RPG, and not have to play with hardcore mode on. We hope that we can create an experience that, that would benefit from having hardcore mode enabled. I would like for this to be Fallout, but with some spices in the form of immersive sim elements uh, thrown onto it. I would like to add more to New Vegas in terms of just what kind of stories we can tell. And as pretentious as I know that sounds, believe me when I say that this is first and foremost an RPG. Below there, it's like some immersive sim elements I hope we could add and a experience that can be benefited from using hardcore mode. Well, and I think when you say things like immersive sim elements, you mean stuff like instead of having to do a long quest to fix a generator, if you're skilled enough, then you can just do it. Because I appreciate those kind of things too, where you build a character a certain way, and then a situation unfolds and it's not, well, you have to dance through the ring of fire and then go and date my daughter and wh or whatever to get the item to bring back. When it's like, look, man, I built a scientist for a reason. Like, let them just do it. I appreciate that kind of stuff. Those elements were what made Fallout 3 interesting when the first time I played it, walking up to the bomb and Megaton, and it's like, oh, well, you could deactivate it if you got the skill. If you've ever like, tried to make a build specifically so that you can repair Eddie, one of the iBot companions, without needing any of the extra materials, Imagine Fallout, but with moments like those just scattered all over the game, where you can basically skip entire segments if you have the right character. I'll admit that's more of a dream game kind of idea than anything else. We now have some questions from some fans. Ooh, I have uh, fans! <laughs> yes. So the first one is from Nectar, who wonders what you can tell us about some of the other factions in the mod. So, I want to preface this by saying that until we have everything ready to go in a design document, Anything I say about the factions here is subject to change. So, with that being said, currently we have three raider gangs, two tribes, one miscellaneous science group, one crime syndicate, and one sort of main governmental faction are all planned to at least be worked on, or at least attempt to be worked on, in Ashfall. For now, I think I'll just go over the three different raider gangs. First thing we worked on before we even started development within the GEC was, okay, what is the story going to be? We need to have, at the very least, a loose outline of events that are going to happen in the main story before we do anything else. Because if we do not have that narrative agreed on once we start developing things, it's just going to all snowball into chaos. Or at least that's what my logic was. The first raider group I want to touch on are the Sovereign Lions. The best way I can talk about the Sovereign Lines is imagine if a bunch of raiders came across the sort of remnants of U.S. history, right? Like they found one or two or three college textbooks about American history and were inspired to try and emulate that. Now, now I'm not saying we're doing a Caesar's Legion. We're not pulling an Edward Sallow here. They essentially want to form their own nation after certain events have taken place in Ashfall's story, or setting more so. This isn't anything the player sees. Currently, our plan for this Sovereign Lions is for them to have turned one of the uh, town hubs into sort of a raider encampment slash trading hub, where they are blockading two other towns from trade and are leeching off the other two towns trading between each other via a toll. The last thing I want any of the of the Sovereign Alliance to be compared to are Raiders from Nuka World. They aren't really flashy at all, they don't have necessarily a gimmick beyond how they see themselves as a sort of new nation that is being born. So 
imagine if, say, the great cons ended up having a sort of hero complex, is the best way I, would, I could describe them. The second rated group we hope to include in Asheville are a group called the Headhunters. They're a cannibalistic raider group or a descendant of groups of pre-war people who hid inside caves when the bombs fell. They're not necessarily mutants or anything like that. I want that distinction to be made. These aren't just tunnelers, but on both legs instead of all fours. Currently, our plan for this raider group is to act as introduction to the different conflicts. They're like the powder gangers of Asheville. They don't have a philosophy they go by, per se. They, they either are cannibalistic raiders or are made up of outcasts from other settlements who were discovered as cannibals. And from there, we have a quest idea for these guys where, during the events of Asheville, they are protecting, quote-unquote, one of the settlements from other raider gangs so that they can feed on that town's people so that they can basically sustain themselves by treating this town as just a massive farm. Finally, we have the Hellraiser Gang. Fun fact, uh, I couldn't pick between the Hellraiser Gang or the name the Filthy 15 for these people because this Raider Gang is mainly based off of rock music. With this particular group, I do want to explore if there are certain levels of Raider activity within the Fallout universe. But these, these guys are basically like college students who are technically raiders who are mostly localized within in this one town and they aren't necessarily going out and attacking innocent people per se and while that doesn't sound raidery these guys still harass and rob caravans they're just not they're not post-nuclear terrorists you know <laughs> they're not devastating towns or murdering children or anything they're not as a bloodthirsty as other raider groups and with these guys they're quest idea I have for them is that they're kind of at a crossroads in their history where they can go down the path of becoming less of a raider group and more of just their own little club where they help out their own communities or they j they can just go full great cons and just start massacring people there's hopefully going to be more to it than that but other than certain contextual situations which depend on the main story and certain things are happening in it I cannot say much about the Hellraiser gang other than that I hope they're more of a rock music themed group so i've got another question from another one of the fans there this one is from ellb6 he's wondering if there'll be an opportunity for speech checks beyond just the normal speech skill oh boy oh boy i am so glad you're asking this okay okay so regarding speech everyone knows that when it comes to speech it's based it, it's basically the but the win button, more or less, right? Well, my idea for speech, and this may or may not change in the near future, is to give some of speech's power to barter and charisma. In Asheville, barter isn't just used for literal bartering. It could just be used for general deal-making as well, negotiations. And then with charisma, I think I would give it a buff where that you cannot access speech checks unless the person you're talking to already kind of likes you to a certain extent. So if you have like a charisma of one, most people aren't going to listen to you because they're not that likable. <laughs> and so because of that, you are, they, it doesn't matter how convincing you are. If that person just doesn't like you, they're not going to listen to you. So I think having charisma sort of be a barrier of entry for certain speech checks could be a good way to reduce speech's powerful abilities within New Vegas's engine. And having other skill checks give access to alternative solutions. Let's say, for example, for a quest, there's a bunch of sick people that need help. Well, if your character's already built to be Mr. Medicine Man, then you can already go in there and help those people yourself. Or even just use your own equipment, like your own stim packs that you've collected up there. If there's like a town group of townspeople that need help with some raiders, you can use your gun skill to teach them how to defend themselves, so that way you don't have to fight them yourself. <laughs> Stuff like that. I wouldn't say that other skill checks are underutilized in New Vegas, but they're definitely not as prevalent or as powerful as speech. And I think with a couple of tweaks and additional uh, outcomes to quests that can be achieved through other skill checks, I, I think it would definitely add more to the experience. I also want to copy from uh, Knights of the Old Republic 2. In Knights of the Old Republic 2, you basically know more about the world if you have more awareness. So I think with Ashfall, I do want to give the use perception to have the player automatically pick up on more details about the world, and they can use that to sort of influence conversations in certain situations. Finally, I do have the idea of having certain perks 
that usually don't have uh, skill checks or anything like that associated with them, giving them their own abilities. With small frame, for example, I had this sort of idea where, oh, what if the player had small frame, they can go through alternative entryways into different buildings. For example, they can just crawl through vents if they have the small frame perk, and that's how they can find, like, secret rooms or whatever. Other than that, there's also stuff like claustrophobia, which on its own is very much so, it's a very detrimental perk to have because half of the game is set within interiors. But I think with claustrophobia, if you meet other characters with claustrophobia, you can kind of relate to them in a way if you also have that trait. And then from there, you can kind of bond with them about your shared uh, phobia. I, I do think that there are plenty of opportunities to be had when it comes to different skills. The issue is, as cool as it does sound on paper, a lot of it does kind of boil down to playtesting. If players think that a charisma check going before a speech check is a bad idea, then we'll probably have to cut it out, because as, as good as the idea sounds to me, if, if it doesn't function correctly, or at least if it's not fun to play around with, then there's no reason for it to be in the mod. How big is the dev team at the moment? Uh, currently, we have roughly 15 people, I want to say. I know for certain that two of those people are game developers in real life, so they can't be on Discord or like work on the mod all the time. Myself and Cellblock Psycho are the only two level designers at the moment. Wallaby is our only composer. We have a couple of writers who are all making sure that Ashfall's story is a well-told one. Not everybody who is working on the writing uh, is a writer per se. Like Wallaby, for example, he came up with a whole backstory for one of the characters, and he's not necessarily in the team as a writer, but he does help with the writing. Are you using public resources to help manage the, the amount of workload? Absolutely. Weapons are not a major concern for me. We are experimenting with making new models for armors and buildings and weapons from the ground up. We currently have the Sharktooth Sword, which is a whole new model. Everything else we hope to include either from modders' resources or eventually NIF bashing weapons together. We briefly had Pineapple Surprise on our team who made the Wakazashi, the Ashfall Wakazashi, which we hope to include for Ashfall's version of the Yakuza. And other than that, we have another weapon, which we are keeping secret in every place except for the Discord. We, we do hope to implement it, it's just the sound design that we are missing. We do want to include weapons from Fallout 2 mainly and reintroduce them in Ashfall, which are all, most of them are available as modders' resources, gun wise. Energy weapons is another story entirely. But when it comes to adding new guns to Ashfall, we can already get all the guns we want and then some from modders' resources. I've been using uh, Butch's weapon, I think it's called like Butch's Final Weapon Pack for a majority, if not all, of Ashfall's new guns. The only thing I'm really missing is like a couple of energy weapons and on one final note regarding weapons besides reintroducing stuff from fallout 2 i am mainly going for a jungle slash beach theme when it comes to ash falls weapons in general so you'll hopefully see some stuff from world war one world war two weapons you might associate with normandy some stuff from vietnam era stuff when it comes to how lore-friendly certain weapons can be, it's hard to find a consistent line between what is and isn't lore-friendly. Because, on the one hand, you have, like, World War II guns, and then in Fallout 1, you have the Desert Eagle, which I'm pretty sure is a gun from the 80s. <laughs> I want to try and strike a balance to, between the certain aesthetics I want for Ashfall and how lore-friendly they can be when it comes to weapons that aren't just from Fallout 2, but now in New Vegas via modders' resources. And I think we all, we've all also been experimenting a little with having uh, AI make art. Like, it's not like you'll see art made by an AI in Asheville, but we are using it here and there to try and get a sort of visual heads up. We have our own concept artists. We do sometimes use AI art to sort of come up with a base idea, and then we just sort of build from it from there. Jeff Hill has asked what the most challenging part of the project has been so far. The more you learn about a thing, the more you realize how much you don't know about it. <laughs> And that's how it feels working on the GEC all the damn time. <laughs> Still, for example, I'm trying to implement weapon NIFs into New Vegas just for, like, to learn it myself, right? And then I try to insert the Winchester City Killer from Fallout 1 and 2, the uh, combat shotgun, as it's called in there. And the textures just don't work, and I don't- I've tried everything, it just will not work. I'll, I'll work on it some other day. It's just moments like that where 
oh, hey, so I, it's just as simple as one, two, three. And then once you try to implement like a new gun or a new like set of armor, it just will not work. And yet, oh God, it, it is frustrating. Imagine if the Gek was like a petulant child with like a gun. <laughs> just, you have to both manage this angry little kid, but you also have to worry about the fact that they have a gun. <laughs> And so that's what it's like working with the Gek at its worst, where you can be working on the Gek, and then it, for some reason it just breaks. Like, early on the project, uh, half of Ashfall's map was just gone, with seemingly no explanation to why. Oh, I remember that! Yeah, it was, yeah. Like, it was, it was the closest the man had ever come to dying. Where yeah, I'm, like, nobody yeah. was sure. It's like, so do we still keep working on assets, or, like, what's going yeah, on with just, World Space? Yeah, the development. Where, uh, now, like, here's the thing. Here's how the morning goes for that. I decide, hey, I'm going to spend one afternoon. I'm going to work on this in Asheville. I boot up the Gek. Where's half the map? And it's like, I go on the, like, the... Um, there's, like, a, a tab where you can see, like, the height map of everything. Half of it's just gone. <laughs> it's just gone. <laughs> and to this to this day, I, I'm still not entirely sure what it happened to cause it. And luckily, we recovered, of course. We had some backups. But it, it was thanks to that incident that we now have a dedicated system for that sort of thing. <laughs> a big part of Fallout is, of course, the music in the game. Wallaby, you are the composer of the mod. What has your approach to music been? For a long time, I've been a live performer, like string and percussion instruments. I've often described myself as like a rock band Swiss Army knife, where you need me to sit guitar, bass, drums, you know, no horns or nothing, sing backups. And I did that for the better part of a decade. And now I'm writing everything on a computer and I'm using virtual instruments and that kind of stuff. I want to create a soundscape that is evocative of some of the similar feelings that, that I remember the first time I played played fallout one or it's like what is this new thing what is this new space because every other game that has come after that has been related to one of uh, to, to the previous titles and all of the lore and the expectations that that are attached to that and like we said before hawaii is a really interesting opportunity because it doesn't seem like there were many if any at all mentions of it in prior lore uh, due to its uh, remote location so it is the discovery of a whole new world because that's the appeal to these sorts of games is the exploration i got a kick out of the first time that i played new vegas on launch and i walked into ranger andy's bungalow or i went onto the fallout wikia and nobody else had done anything else like oh good i get to make that entry ranger andy da, da, da. the discovery is what's really interesting to me and so that that's where i'm starting with and then from there i want to generate not necessarily specifically a soundtrack before, but more of a soundscape there'll be maybe some traditional sounds but also maybe some non-traditional sounds because that's that's something that i really like i like to take my little hand recorder and go out and capture stuff and then bring it back on my computer and play with it and get something weird out of it and see if it's something that i can do with it that's fun but then also like and i don't even think i've mentioned any of this to ash yet but i had a thought in my mind because i just moved to indianapolis and so i'm thinking about the possibilities of hiring real musicians to do some of the parts that i'll end up writing like we're talking about the raider gang that's got the loud music and like i said i haven't even said this to ash yet so he's gonna be hearing this for the first time what if i've just found a punk band that like oh, had some good music they could just do some voices too they're the raiders and then their music's in there too good lord that's i I mean, if that, I don't even know how I would respond to that if that were the case. That would be spectacular. <laughs> That's kind of an opportunity I can get now with this relocation. That's the kind of stuff that I would be interested in doing. The things that I love about Fallout music in the past is the way that it just seems to be set dressing for all of the scenery. And it just sits so nicely in the mix with the other sound design. Is there an area where you think the project needs some more help? If anyone here even knows a guy who's on Hawaii, let them know that we're looking for them. Because the way I see it, there's no way we can have anything story-wise approved uh, until somebody who's actually from Hawaii can make sense of it. I forget who said it exactly. I think I want to say it's Josh Sawyer who said that if you cannot visit a place yourself, you have to do as much research as you can on it. And I agree with that. I'm doing as much research as I can. I just think that in addition to that, I since no one on the dev team as of right now is from Hawaii, we need somebody who is who has 
their own personal experiences in this very real state to be here to make sure that we're not in over our heads when it comes to certain ideas about it. Now, Wallaby, you've given us a piece of music to close the show. Uh, Can you tell me what it's called? I haven't released anything from the mod yet. This is just a song that I've done in the last year in experimenting with the features that I have on this software. Because like I said, this is a writing music on the computer of a new endeavor for me. But I got to play around with merging a couple of different styles. I'm really getting into using brass and strings like that. That's fun, uh, especially because I grew up before I was in rock bands. Like I played in a lot of orchestras in school, so that's neat. And I think that's another thing that tied me back to Fallout. This piece is relative in Fallout to a way. It's called I Left My Heart in Dong. And Dongnachan is uh, a city. It's uh, 45 minutes by train north of Seoul in South Korea. And it's where I was uh, stationed in the army for a while. And it's actually where I played uh, Fallout 3 for the first time and got back into Fallout. I thought it would be appropriate to share because there's some interesting moments in the song that to me represent naivete before a, a discovery of some magnitude is discovered and then the consequences if you will of of now to live with new information that maybe it's good or maybe it's bad this song represents the sort of depth that i want to convey in the music maybe sans uh auxiliary sound design okay well i can see that the links with what you're talking about with the naivety because that makes me think of the main quest in most of the fallout games you start with something very petty and personal but not knowing anything about the world and then halfway around you it's all turned on its head you've got knowledge of the world and now you have to save it or end it as the exactly goes. so thanks again for joining us there ash and wallaby and as promised this is wallaby's track i left my heart in dong Duchong. chong